Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Uh, we're, I'm anxious to get started our reading and discussion of the book, uh, The Papacy and the Civil Power. We're talking about the steady rise of ascendancy of the Pope in his temporal realm. That is, to become king of kings. And proving through history, undisputed history, that the popes did not have temporal power early in their beginnings, but that it has evolved over time and increased in strength. Rather than being uh, uh, an official divine right office of the papacy, the temporal power is a man-made institution or rather, more correctly stated, it's an institution of Satan. The papacy claims to be king of kings and lord of lords and to rule over the kings of the earth in the temporal realm and thereby blasphemously arrogating the true position of Christ that only he has. Now, it's evident through history that the popes early on had no temporal power. They claimed a spiritual power, which to many uh, he rightly possessed. That, too, is incorrect. The assertion of Inquisition update is that the pope is the biblical and historical antichrist, fulfills all the prophecies of the Bible regarding Antichrist, and it is a counterfeit system, wholly created by men, evil, wicked men, led by a spirit of Satan. Now, those are strong words, but I don't retract any of them. It's true. I've been researching this for a long time, and one of the books that makes this most evident is this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. I hope you can find a used copy of this book. It's getting to be rather difficult to find, but it would be important both to your understanding of history and the Bible to get this book and read it and share it with friends and family. Now we're going to continue. I'm going to begin on page 278, or excuse me, 273, the last uh, sentence or two at the bottom of the page. It says, and thus it is certain that at the close of the pontificate of Felix II in the year 492, the Pope of Rome neither had nor claimed to have any temporal power as a part of the quote-unquote patrimony of Peter or derived in any other way. He was a mere bishop, like the bishops of Alexandria, Corinth, and other places, and his powers were limited to the administration of spiritual affairs. In temporal matters, he was as much subject to the emperor and the laws of the empire as any of the inferior clergy or the people. The struggle, however, for the acquisition of temporal power went on all the time, with results varying according to the circumstances. The strong popes gained upon the weak emperors, but the latter were courageous enough to assert and maintain the authority of the empire. The papacy was dwarfed into the narrowest proportions. The church, in the meantime, was left to drift along into whatsoever currents the interest and ambition of the contending factions carried it, and the cause of genuine Christianity was made subordinate to political rivalries and would have expired if God had not preserved, even in Rome, faithful guardians to shelter and preserve it. My belief is that R.W. Thompson is being extremely generous to the Roman Catholic Church here. I believe the Roman Catholic Church, though prophesied by God to exist until God destroys it, is not so much protected by the guardians of the faith or by Christianity. It is a wholly human 
protected institution. It is prophesied to exist in the world and to be the counterfeit of the true kingdom of Christ, to test God's people to see who they will serve, Christ or Antichrist. Now, continuing now where we left off Friday at the end of the broadcast, it says, The century which elapsed between the pontificate of Felix II and that of Gregory I, embracing the reigns of 15 popes, contributed but little toward conferring temporal power upon the Bishop of Rome. The emperors continued to maintain their ascendancy, although the angry controversies between the East and Western Christians kept up a perpetual strife between Rome and Constantinople, in which some of the popes proved themselves the superiors of the emperors in the management of public affairs. There was no relaxation of their efforts to consummate the policy of Pope Leo I by bringing all the existing governments of the world into subjection to the papacy. I'll bet most of my listeners did not know, as I have discovered in my discussions on amateur radio, most people are oblivious to the idea that the Pope intends to rule the world. That's been the preoccupation of the papacy since the very beginning. It's true, and it still goes on today. And the author continues, he says, On the contrary, this became a ruling and controlling pa uh, passion. This bringing all, uh, into, uh, all existing governments of the world into subjection to the papacy. It says, on the contrary, this became a ruling and controlling passion, which never underwent abatement, except when policy and expediency dictated it, and then only to make the final triumph more sure. In the year 498, two popes were elected, one at Constantinople and the other at Rome. Neither being disposed to give up his pretensions, it was submitted to the judgment of King Theodoric of Ravenna to decide between them, a fact which proves that worldly policy, far more than the influence of the Holy Ghost, was allowed to settle the important question as to who should be the successor of Peter and God's vicar on earth. Pope Symmachus in whose favor the king decided, while he made no claim of temporal power as against the emperor, did assert a spiritual jurisdiction over the world, which, if it had been conceded to him, would have absorbed the temporal power. He told the emperor Anastasius that he was superior to all the princes of earth, because they governed human affairs while he disposed of the quote-unquote goods of heaven, a pretense precisely like that now set up by Pope Pius IX, that the encyclical being above, or excuse me, that the ecclesiastical, that is the spiritual, being above the temporal and civil authority, was the divine right to dictate its policies and govern the world. By the year 529, priestly ambition had become almost universal, and as a natural consequence, popes were elected by intrigue and the most corrupt means. In that year, Boniface II was elected by one party and a rival pope by a party at Rome. But Boniface triumphed over his rival and had the satisfaction of anathematizing him after death had removed him out of the way. To prevent the recurrence of such an event, he convened a council at the Church of Peter's in Rome and had a decree passed allowing him to designate his successor. Having secured this extraordinary power in violation of the universal practice of the Church, he appointed one whom he required whom he required the bishops to recognize, quote, by oath and in writing, unquote. This was, of course, infallibly done without the possibility of error. 
But another council was soon after convened, and this decree was set aside when Boniface cast his own infallible bull into the flames. At his death, quote, the Holy See being set up at auction, unquote, was obtained by John II, who, quote, paid enormous sums to his competitors and obtained the pontifical tiara, unquote. The senators, who then had a voice in the election, sold their votes openly, and the general corruption was shameless and disgusting. So little respect had one pope for another that Pope Agapetus, the successor of Felix II, burned in public the bull of anathema which Pope Boniface had published against his rival, and thus one infallible pope condemned the other. Pope Agapetus was not much influenced by the prevailing ambition and was disposed both by precept and example to arrest the evils of the times. He submitted as a dutiful subject to the emperor of Justinian in temporal affairs and to the councils of the church in spiritual, seemingly endowed with a commendable degree of Christian humility. On account of this, he never reached on the records of church history a higher eminence than to be known as a man of sincerity and of more integrity than most of the popes of that age. At his death, the scenes attended the election of his successor were disgracefully corrupt. Says Cormenin, quote, Priests sold their suffrages, cabals struggled, raised upon their competitors and carried off the partisans of their adversaries, and at length victory remained with the richest, the most skillful, and the most corrupt, unquote. This same author also says that Silverius bought the pontificate from King Theodatus, but Dupin, while admitting that Anastasius affirmed this to be true, is disposed to doubt it and to follow Liber uh, Liberatus, quote, an author more ancient and more credible than Anastasius, unquote, who supposed that the, elect the election of Severius was regular and canonical. Be this as it may, it is unquestionably true that Theodatus desired to secure a pope devoted to his interests, that he might more readily prevent Belisarius from marching his army upon Rome. And whether he sold the pontificate to, Silv to Silverius or he was canonically elected, it cannot be doubted that the king assented to it with the understanding that he should have the assistance of the pope. But Belisarius entered Rome with an army of 150,000 Goths, and Silverius either did or, quote, was suspected of holding correspondence, unquote, with him, thus betraying the king and turning over the city to these terrible enemies. If Belisarius was in, uh, thus enjoyed the fruits of the pope's treason, he was not disposed to leave the traitor unpunished. He therefore deposed Silverius and elected Vigilius to the pontificate. This infallible pope caused the, the deposed but equally infallible Silverius to be banished to a desert island under charge of ex executioners to put him to death by the slow process of starvation. How's that for Christian charity, right? And it says, yet notwithstanding all this, Vigilius was recognized by a general council and, quote, acknowledged for a lawful pope, unquote, says Dupin, quote, without proceeding to a new election or even confirming that which had been made. His name, as also that of Silverius, who has been made a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, is found in every published list of the popes, and strange as it may now seem, one of the ecumenical councils of the church, the second of Constantinople, was held under his pontificate and received all of its authority and validity from his official approval as the infallible successor of Peter. 
He was made Pope November 20th of 537 A.D., and the death of Silverius did not occur until June 20th of 538 A.D. Yet Butler says, quote, Vigilius was an ambitious intruder and a schismatic as long as St. Silverius lived, but after his death became lawful pope by the ratification or consent of the Roman Church, and from that time renounced the errors and commerce of the heretics, a method of covering up the heresy and tergiversations of a pope neither ingenious nor plausible. His fierce contest with the Emperor Justinian about the three chapters, and I didn't know, I've never heard anything about the three chapters before, and the author gives us a note about these three chapters. So I'll read it so my listeners will know what he's talking about. He said, The history of this general council of the pontificate of Vigilius is most instructive to the student of ecclesiastical history. The chief points of controversy in the Roman Church at that time arose out of what were called the three chapters, that is, the Nestorian heresy contained in the writings of Theodoret, bishop of Cyrus, a letter of Ibas, bishop of Edessa, and the works of Theodore, bishop of Mopsueta. These were condemned by the emperor Justinian. But Pope Vigilius rejected his edict and excommunicated Theodorus of Caesarea, its author. The council was convened, excuse me. It says the council was convened to settle the controversy. It condemned the three chapters, but not their authors having decided that the works of an author could be justly censured without condemning him personally. Vigilius refused at first to approve this condemnation and was banished. Nevertheless, says Dupin, not being guided by zeal for the truth, but by his own caprice and interest, he quickly condemned them after an authentic manner that he might return into Italy." Unquote. So there's what the author gives us about these three chapters. At any rate, he says, his fierce contest with the Emperor Justinian about the three chapters led to his being summoned to Constantinople by the Emperor when he was arrested and held in custody. On his return to Rome after his release, he died, as some have supposed, by poison when Pelagius I, by order of Justinian, and without waiting for the formality of an election, clothed himself with the pontifical mantle and declared himself Pope. When he reached Rome, the clergy and the people refused to recognize him and charged him with the murder of Vig Vigilius. With the assistance, however, of the temporal authority of the emperor, he maintained himself on the chair of Peter, for nearly four years. This combination of facts gives but little support to the pretense that popes are always elected by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and still less to the doctrine of papal infallibility, and, may it, may it be duly noted, and temporal power. In the year 566, two bishops of Burgundy were were convicted by a provincial synod of adultery, rape, and murder, and were expelled from their sees. They appealed to Pope John III as spiritual head of the Roman Church, and he restored them. Such examples could not do otherwise than lead to many abuses and extortions, as well as to great assumption of pontifical authority. The latter, pontifical authority, was carried to such an extent that some of the popes declared themselves the dispensers of a fourth part of the property of the Roman Church in order that thereby they might become the, disturb, uh, the distributors of large rewards to their dependents and their friends. By these means, they were so rapidly becoming the rivals of princes that the latter resolved upon resisting with more firmness their efforts to acquire absolute independence and superiority. 
The emperor, therefore, decreed that his consent should be necessary to the valid election of the bishops of Rome, Ravenna, and Milan. This decree was enforced at the election of Pope Gregory I in the year 590 A.D. Gregory, from humility, it is said, wrote to the emperor to induce him not to confirm his election, a circumstance which excludes all possibility that there having been any temporal power possessed by the popes up to the close of the 6th century. The popes unquestioningly struggled hard to acquire it, but without success. Their ambition was unbounded, and such was the character of the most of, the most of them that they would have adopted any means to attain their end. Yet they were held in inferiority by the strength of the imperial power and compelled to remain subjects. By their machinations and the perpetual schisms they engendered, they succeeded in the end in sundering all the bonds of affection and alliance between the Eastern and Western churches. They had to await the rise of more powerful allies in the West, of Pepin and Charlemagne, before they could break the ties of their alliance to the, to the uh, excuse me, their allegiance to the empire. But they succeeded in this also by the infliction of terrible blows upon the true prosperity of the church. If the, people, if the peaceful diffusion of the gospel had been their sole object and the Christian spirit of charity and toleration had occupied their minds, their personal struggles with each other and their numerous controversies about heresy would have been attended with far less disastrous results and would have given rise to so much cru uh, that ha uh, and would not have given rise to so much cruelty and persecution but other and more unworthy motives prevailed temporal ambition took the place of higher christian virtues and whatever they did was centered in the groveling object of acquiring earthly power the government of the world became a great prize for which the combatants contended on both sides, and the cause of Christianity was only saved from final and complete overthrow by the sheltering protection of providence and the courage of the few pious and devoted men who, in spite of all the prevailing corruption, preserved their own Christian integrity and the teachings of the Apostolic Fathers. And again, I believe R.W. Thompson is giving too much credit to this Antichrist Church. But still, one cannot argue after hearing the facts that the Pope is a usurper. And this claim of temporal power by the papacy is exposed in history as being a human endeavor, not authorized by God, and we all, Catholic, Protestant, and otherwise, need to consider what role the papacy now plays in the world and reject it as a man-made contrivance. And history reveals, too, that it is the most bloody persecutor of God's people to ever draw a breath on this planet. We've come upon the break. You were listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned for the messages. We'll be right back and continue our reading in the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. We'll begin Chapter 10. R.W. Thompson begins each chapter with a brief list of all the subjects that he will be discussing in the chapter. And in this chapter, we'll be discussing churches independent before Constantine. That's right. After Constantine, the churches underwent a dramatic change. That is the rise of the Bishop of Rome, whereas before they were each governed by their individual bishops. That was the tr that was the church that Christ established. That was the church the, the churches that that uh, the apostles established. And uh, after the apostles died, the usurper rose and uh, corrupted that, uh, 
that original church. Anyway, we'll continue. Victor I, endeavoring to establish the supremacy of Rome. We're going to discuss the ambition of the popes, aided Constantine to overthrow Maxentius, and the consequences of that. Constantine, a usurper, Maxentius, the lawful emperor, Constantine baptized before his death, his motives, influence upon Roman clergy, Arianism, the Council of Nicaea, the Pope had nothing to do with it, called by the emperor and said the Pope did not preside by his legates, he did not approve the de decrees as necessary to the validity. Constantine was the master spirit. He dictated the creed. He fixed infallibility in the council. The council did not decree the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. It enacted only 20 canons. All other pretended ones are forgeries. Quite a list of subjects to be discussed in this chapter, and I hope I can do justice to all of it for your vital understanding about the Roman Catholic Church and the pretense of the papacy in the world today. It said, The many schisms which have occurred in the Roman Catholic Church and the frequent elections of rival and hostile popes led to the conclusion that there's something inherent in the papal system which renders entire unity impossible. As all minds of any intelligent natural excuse me as all minds of any intelligence naturally repel any attack upon their independence, the harshness and severity employed by the popes to keep this class of minds in subjection have necessarily induced antagonisms. The ignorant alone, outside the governing class, have proved submissive, and they, and they only because they are unconscious of their inferiority. These, for many centuries, constituted the mercenary armies of the papacy. The mercenary armies of the papacy were the ignorant, those who did not understand what the papacy really stands for in the world. They just blindly acquiesced to this man called the Pope. And it says there's no difficulty in tracing this want of unity to its real source or in showing that but for the disturbance of Christian harmony in the church by such popes as subordinated the interests of Christianity to the accomplishment of their own personal ends, Roman Catholicism might have been today a very different thing than what it is. It might have been one of the most powerful and effective instruments in carrying on the work of improving and elevating the world. And the present Pope, instead of speaking of Pope Pius IX, who was reigning at the time of the writing of this book, the author says, and the present Pope, and I'll insert Pope Pius IX, instead of sending forth mingled curses and groans from a pretended prison, that is the Vatican, might have united the general rejoicing at the advanced condition into which modern Christianity and civilization have brought the nations. Now he's lauding Protestantism here. The world had advanced. The Pope was rejected. The Vatican literally became a prison for the Pope. The whole world was going the Protestant way. And the world was advancing. And it says, The Church of Christ was undoubtedly established upon a rock, because the faith upon which it rested was designed to be more immovable than the mountains. Love charity, harmony, and all the heavenly virtues clustered together at, the, at its foundation, and there can be nothing rightfully about it to destroy its symmetry or mar its beauty. But the papal system is constructed out of uncongenial and inharmonious materials. It was the work of man, not God erected out of beautiful materials gathered from the partial wreck of apostolic Christianity. 
by mingling them with the rude fragments of pagan Rome, it lacks the symmetry of a perfect plan and displays the conflicting designs of its various architects. How eloquent this author just described the Roman Catholic Church. It was built on a partially compromised truth. And then it was mingled with ancient Roman paganism. At best, it's a mess. And now he says, its external organization has grown out of illiberal and unchristian divisions fomented by designing popes and prelates with no higher object than to gain authority and distinction for themselves, even at the sacrifice of the simple faith and worship of the early Christians. Its own factions have never ceased to prey upon its vitals from the hour of its birth, and have been to each other what the plagues sent down from the gods were to those who first stole fire from heaven. It has made fierce and cruel war upon everything that stood in its path or endeavored to check its ambition. And if at any time it has been met by intolerance, the weapons used against it have been supplied from its own armory and, be and, and belong to the brood of monsters which itself has hatched. Before the time of Constantine, each of the several churches planted by the apostles and the early fathers exercised its own jurisdiction over its own members and thus preserved harmony in faith and worship. The right of visitorial guardianship exercised by the apostles while planting and watering them in infancy existed no longer because there was no longer any necessity for it. But while each church governed its own affairs, they all realized the necessity of preserving a spirit of unity and such brotherhood and fellowship among the whole as would enable them to, sim sim uh, sympathize, to sympathize with and assist each other in the adjustment of their local disagreements, if any should arise. A harmonious and beautiful Christian system was thus created worthy of the divine approval, and under it, the Catholic Apostolic Church was able to stand up and ward off the staggering blows of the pagan emperors. Now, I want to stop and comment. This phrase, this descriptive phrase called the Catholic Apostolic Church, is another example of how some some people like to describe the body of Christ as a, a Catholic church. In other words, a universal church. I don't do that. And I want my listeners to know when I speak of the Catholic church, I'm speaking of the Roman Catholic church. But I'll let this author use the convention that he chooses here in describing the true body of Christ as the Catholic apostolic church. It's confusing, and that's why I don't, I don't use that convention to describe the body of Christ. Catholic, in my, out of my tongue, represents the Roman Catholic Church. I describe the body of Christ the way the Bible describes it, as the body of Christ. I don't see anywhere in the Scripture where the body of Christ is called Catholic or universal. And so I stay away from that confusing convention. Now, the author continues, he says, The first efforts to disturb this harmony were made by the bishops of Rome. About the beginning of the third century, Victor I, with a view to establish the primacy of the Church of Rome, endeavored to compel, uh, endeavored to compel the Asiatic churches by threats of excommunication, to conform to its custom in keeping the festival of Easter. 
About half a century afterwards, Stephen I attempted to assume jurisdiction over the churches of Spain, and still later Dionysius made a like attempt over the church at Alexandria. These attempts at ecclesiastical absolutism at Rome were so sternly rebuked by the great fathers Irenaeus and Cyprian as to demonstrate that the uh, that the leading churches could not be subjugated unless by some power they were unable to resist. The bishops of Rome soon saw that this power was political imperialism, and they availed themselves of the first opportunity of uniting church and state at Rome in order to obtain possession of it. This opportunity was the arrival of Constantine, at the time when the corrupt materials necessary for such a union were abundant at Rome. Eusebius, who was a prelate of eminence at that time, gives this account of the clergy, quote, But when, by reason of excess liberty, we sunk into negligence and sloth, one envying and rivaling another in different ways, and we were almost, as it were, on the point of taking up arms against each other and were assailing each other with words and with darts and spears, prelates in vain against prelates and people rising up against people, and hypocrisy and dissimulation had arisen to the greatest height of malignity when the divine judgment began to inflict its episcopacy. But some that appeared to be our pastors, deserting the law of piety, were inflamed against each other with mutual strifes, only accumulating quarrels and threats, rivalship, hostility, and hatred to each other, only anxious to assert the government as a kind of sovereignty for themselves." Unquote. It has been charged that Marcellinus who was Bishop of Rome in 304 A.D., shortly before the arrival of Constantine, quote, solemnly abjured the Christian religion and offered incense to idols in the temples of Isis and Vesta, unquote. However this may be, it is not at all wonderful in view of the condition of things pictured by Eusebius then when Melchiades, a few years later, uh, became Bishop of Rome, he was, he was willing that the reigning emperor should be removed and the empire seized by Constantine in order thereby to unite his fortunes with the state and those of the state with the Roman church. Constantine was not a member of the church, then the only visible sign of Christianity. But the bishop and clergy of Rome assisted him to expel Maxentius, the reigning emperor, expecting to receive, if not upon the express condition that they should, should receive, the direct favor and protection of the empire. With the emperor on their side, they could readily see how easy it would be to draw all religious contro uh, to draw all the religious controversies throughout the empire to Rome and thus lay the foundation for the supremacy of the church there. But even without this, their rebellion against Maxentius was followed with results both direct and consequential. The direct were the union of church and state, the introduction of secular affairs into the church, the increase of ambition and corruption among the clergy, and the planting of the foundations upon which the monstrous usurpations of the papacy have since rested. The consequences were the introduction of measures which overthrew the, primal, uh, the primitive church, the spreading of discord, jealousy, and divisions throughout all the churches, and finally, the great schism which separated the Eastern and the Western uh, Christians. It is worthy to be repeated that before the time of Constantine, each of the churches in Asia, Africa, and Europe had enjoyed its own independence with no asserted or recognized principality in either over the others. Rome had no power, no more power than Alexandria, 
or Alexandria, then Antioch, or Antioch, then Jerusalem. As the most ancient and first established churches, those of Jerusalem and Antioch had a sort of precedence of honor derived from the association of the names of the apostles James, the Lord's brother, and Peter and Paul with their history. But in neither of them had there been any pretense of authority or primacy set up. They were content to adhere in what they did and taught to the practice of that forbearance, charity, and toleration exhibited in the apostolic assembly at Jerusalem by which they hope to lead the world into that condition of meekness and humility which is experienced at the genuine impress of true Christianity upon the heart, whether it be that of prince or peasant. Eusebius gives us also an account of the rapid progress of Christianity under these influences. He speaks of, quote, those vast collections of men that flock to the religion of Christ, and those multitudes crowding in from every city, and the illustrious concourse in the houses of worship, unquote. Such results could have been produced only by the example of pious and holy lives on the part of the ministers of religion, of such lives as would arrest the attention of the multitude and prove to them how far preferable and how much more ennobling and elevating was practical Christianity than any of the old philosophies. The reverse of this flattering picture, which he likewise painted, could only have been produced by other examples of the very opposite character, such as had been their birth in the prevailing pride and ambition of Rome. When Constantine reached Rome not yet being a Christian, even by profession, he manifestly desired to secure the cooperation of both pagans and Christians in order to maintain possession of the empire, which was his chief desire. He had no legal claim to, the, to, the, to rule in Rome. At the division of the empire by Diocletian, he selected three colleagues to govern it jointly with himself. Maximinian, Calarius and Constantius, the father of Constantine. None of these had any other claim to the title Caesar than this. The distribution of the empire was as follows. To Constant, Constant, Constantius excuse me, were given Gaul, Spain, and Britain. To Galerius, the valley of the Danube. To, Maxim, to Maximian, Italy and Africa and Diocletian retained Thrace, Egypt, and Asia. Maximian, therefore, was emperor at Rome. At his death in 306 A.D., Maxentius, his son, became his successor by the act of the quote-unquote quote applauding senate and people, unquote, which placed him lawfully in possession of that part of the empire. About that time, Constantius died in Britain while administering his part of the empire. Constantine was present, and upon him his father, quote, committed the, the administration of the empire, unquote, upon the principle that, being his eldest son, he was entitled to it by the law of inheritance. In no possible view of this act can it be said to have conferred upon Constantine any right to that part of the empire in which Rome was situated. Giving to his right by inheritance, or gift from his father, the utmost extent, his jurisdiction as emperor was confined to the countries over which Constantius ruled, that is, Gaul, Spain, and Britain. He, however, was not content with this. The field was not large enough for the gratification of ordinary ambition like his. Excuse me, inordinary ambition like his. Eusebius, his only biographer, tells us that, quote, he drove from his dominions like untamed savage beasts, unquote, those who seemed incapable of civilization, quote, reduced to submission, Unquote, parts of Britain, uh, parts of Britain, 
and then, quote, proceeded to consider the state of the remaining portions of the empire, unquote. No part of it attracted his attention so much as Rome, quote, the imperial city, unquote, and he therefore, quote, prepared himself for the effectual suppression of the tyranny, unquote, which prevailed there under Maxentius, that is, for snatching the imperial crown from the brow of Maxentius and putting it upon his own. The pretense that he desired to go to Rome to re, uh, relieve the Christians there from the oppression of Maxentius is idle, for he was not yet a Christian. He desired the empire, and for that purpose alone he marched his army to Rome. Upon reaching there, he had two things to do in order to secure his desired success. First, to drive out Maxentius, and second, to conciliate the inhabitants. The first accomplished, he undertook the second by granting equal freedom of religion. Excuse me. Pages are stuck together here. At uh, the first accomplished, that is, throwing out Maxentius, he then undertook the second by granting equal freedom of religious worship to both Christians and pagans thereby signifying his condemnation of religious persecution. This was altogether conformable to the wishes of the Christians, for up to that period, the example of toleration set by the apostles and the early Christians had been universally practiced by them, except in the instance where the bishop of Rome had endeavored to establish their primacy over those and other churches." Thus established in Rome, Constantine entered immediately upon a system of measures by means of which the clergy were greatly advanced as a reward for their support of his cause. He conferred great favors upon them, such as they had never before enjoyed. Those already corrupted by the prevailing disorders of which Eusebius speaks were beyond all doubt quite ready to accept this arrangement without any inquiry beyond the mere questions of personal benefit to themselves, and as these had control of the church at Rome, it soon resulted in uniting the church and the state together in such a way as to make one independent, uh, excuse me, to make one dependent on the other. Even then he had not become a Christian by uniting the church, nor did he do so for a number of years after the Council of Nice. Yet he convened the council, was present during its sessions, participated in its deliberations, and dictated its decisions. It is a gross perversion of history to call him a Christian emperor in the sense that the papists continually do, for none of the fathers from whom we derive information of those times gives any account of his baptism into the church until he was about to die long after his capture of Rome. Socrates says that in the 65th year of his age, he received, quote, Christian baptism, unquote, in Nicomedia and died in a few days. Sozomen says the same thing, adding that it was in the 35th year of his reign. And so does Theodoret, and also Eusebius. Eusebius talks about God having frequently manifested himself to him, and everybody is familiar with his story about the sign of the cross in the heavens, and it is undoubtedly true that he had great respect for Christianity. But all this does not go to show, against other acknowledged facts, that he had become so connected with the church at Rome as to be moved by motives of piety alone to bestow so many royal favors upon it. The fact is, he never united the church of Rome at all. When baptized at Nicomedia, the ceremony was performed by Arian bishops and an Arian church, so that he never was, according to the te teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, an Orthodox Christian, but died as he had lived, a heretic. And Rome loves to champion the Christian Constantine when he was none of it. That's the basis of the Antichrist Church of Rome. We'll talk more about it tomorrow. Thanks for listening. See you.